In the final days of the Ford government's first year in power, it did pass the More Homes, More Choice Act. Bill 108 makes sweeping changes to land use planning across the province, and while it might now be law, its opponents aren't going quietly. Here for their perspectives, Josh Matlow, Toronto City Councillor for Ward 12 St. Paul's, Joe Vaccaro, CEO of the Ontario Home Builders Association, Tim Hudak, CEO of the Ontario Real Estate Association, and Jennifer Kiesmat, CEO of the Kiesmat Group, former chief planner for the City of Toronto, of course, and we're happy to welcome you all back here to TVO. Just for those who aren't as up on this as you guys are, Sheldon, you want to bring this graphic up and we'll just cut to the red tape? Or I guess, no, here we go. More Homes, More Choice Act cuts red tape to speed up the process from application to shovels in the ground. It encourages different types of housing, for example, basement apartments allowed where they weren't before. It changes the Planning Act to simplify development charges by creating a new Community Benefits Authority. It exempts development charges for the construction of secondary suites and encourages density around bus and light rail stations. That's just some of the highlights of this. And I'd like to go around the table and just get, give me your sort of 30 second elevator pitch on whether we like or we don't like where this thing is going. Josh. Well, the Ford government has sold this as the answer to the affordability crisis in Toronto and here in Southern Ontario. The reality is um, this does little to nothing to address affordability. I'm not just saying that. Our chief planner, Greg Lintern, has said the same thing. What this does do is essentially hand the development planning process over to the development industry, who have been lobbying them for a long time to get these changes to happen. This allows for heights and densities that were not envisaged under the city's official plan. It over-intensifies certain areas, along with, by the way, they've, they've removed uh, our plans for our secondary plans, like here, Young and Eglinton and downtown. So we will no longer have assurances for dedicated park space. We will not have assurances that childcare, uh, recreation, uh, transit, quality of life issues, infrastructure will keep up with the pace of growth. Okay, hold right there, Joe Vaccaro. Well, I mean, we, we take the approach that says we recognize that, or we're told by the province least, that 2.6 million people are going to be joining this region by 2031. And so the elephant in the room in that conversation is demand is real. People are coming to this region. And so the need for a housing system that responds to that demand in a time away is important. And I think what this bill does, from our perspective, is it deals with the housing system in a complete way, not just piecemealing, planning, development charges, and all these other issues. At the end of the day, it's about supply. We firmly believe more, ho more homes create better affordability for everyone across the province. So from a supply standpoint, if this is gonna cut red tape and get us to building more, that can only be a good thing for our communities. Jennifer Keysmat. Well, this is kind of a complicated issue and there's a really big debate about the role of supply in addressing affordability. And we can look back internationally at cities around the world and assess whether supply makes housing more affordable. And you would think in a simple supply and demand system that that would be the case. But in fact, there is no city on earth. There is no city on earth where simply adding supply in an open global market system has created affordable housing. New York City ran this experiment under Bloomberg. They added more supply than had ever been added in the history of New York City. And what happened? Prices went like this. So we know that... The because why? The supply just can never keep up with the demand? Exactly. So, and to the point, we know a significant number of people are coming to this region. We know that we, we have to provide housing for everyone. We have to provide housing for people along the entire ecosystem, meaning uh, families, meaning people in the service industry. And the risk, of course, is that without very clear policies to achieve that, like inclu inclusionary zoning, it simply won't only happened through the market. Tim Hudak. So look, everybody watching the agenda tonight has this story in their family or their neighbors. They've got their daughter, did everything right, played by the rules, she's got her degree, she got a good job, can't find an affordable place to call home to save her life. Still stuck there in mom and dad's basement. What do you do about that? Number one, you gotta get taxes down. They're punishing when it comes to buying a home, especially in the city of Toronto with a double land transfer tax. Number two is you need to adjust the mortgage rules. It's getting harder to get a mortgage. But the most essential answer to this is more housing supply, more homes, more choices. The Ontario Real Estate Association, which I'm the CEO, put 10 ideas on the table to help that young woman find a place to call home. The government put eight of those in this bill. It is going to help solve our housing affordability crisis. What about the notion, Joe, that it is impossible to keep up, even if you increase supply significantly, unprecedentedly, 
as Jennifer just suggested, it won't be enough to keep up with demand because demand is just going through the roof. Well, I think what's important to understand is the, the, the bill put forward is not just simply about new. It talks about secondary suites. It talks about rental. It's a, it's a bill that talks about all the different options that you have. And I think sometimes we talk about the housing system and we get locked into a planning discussion or a taxes discussion. But if you look at the entire system, then everyone's got a role to play. So beyond simply you know, moving approvals forward, the financial taxes you put against that project have an impact on that price point as well. The ability to get it through the system within a five-year window versus a 10-year window has an impact. So I think you start with a supply discussion, but then to your point, there's more to it than simply just a supply piece. There are policies that go with that. But sometimes those policies are actually counter to the entire idea of creating better affordability. Josh. With all due respect, though, uh, you know, industry lobbyists like yourselves, with all due respect, and the Ford government has said that this is about affordability and supply. The reality is there are over 140,000 units that have already been approved that the development industry hasn't built. The city of Toronto is, has been, on average, approving over 17,000 units a year. There is no issue around supply. One of the things that Bill 108 does is it brings back the OMB rules. And what it does is also removes the city's ability to ensure that growth will pay for growth. It removes Section 37, it removes the development charges, it removes 42, and it puts it into this sort of pool of community benefits without assurance that basic essential services and infrastructure will keep up with the pace of growth. Can I, can I just understand something here? You said a whole bunch of units have been approved but not built yet? That's yeah. correct. That we're, 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 uh, that's up to the development industry to move on uh, and actually build them. But what we've seen, though, is that the OMB was there for decades. What did we end up with? Luxury condos and some high-end rental. We have not seen affordability come into play. What we could see the government do is actually provide policy levers, I believe like Jen was alluding to, including not restricting inclusionary zoning to certain transit hubs, but allowing the city of Toronto to get on with mandating that we have affordable units throughout our city. Okay, Tim wants And it. much more. Yeah, look, I mean, we, we tried uh, Josh's, you know, alarmist language and obstructionist policies for a decade. What did we get? A housing crisis in the city of Toronto and across the GTA. That means that people who did everything right cannot get in the marketplace. And, and that's, it seems ludicrous to me to argue that supply is not an issue when my members, the realtors, are out there every day with more and more people chasing fewer and fewer homes. You gotta do that in a smart way, like intensifying around transit hubs. That's part of Bill 108. The government can play a role by bringing more government land into play. And in return with developers, they could have subsidized units for low-income families. The problem is when a family can't move up when the kids get bigger to uh, move up home or they can't get in the first place, they back into the rentals. And then people don't get into rentals and new units aren't created. And that means the most vulnerable people never get housing to begin with. This impacts right across the spectrum. Jennifer. So one of the funny things about this bill is that um, there's a lot of talk about supply. And I think there's a broad consensus that we need more supply. And the question becomes, what's the best way to deliver that supply? And in particular, affordable supply to the point that Josh made when I was chief planner in the city we were already being beaten up about the planning process and the risk that the planning process presented to affordability so we upended the planning process and began delivering uh, new units in a completely different way which resulted in 20 percent more units being approved on an annual basis now that's one of the reasons why we have more units under construction than any other city in North America. In a pure supply and demand model, we should actually be the least expensive city in North That's America right. because we're building more units <clears throat> than anyone else. But what that demonstrates to us is that there are market mechanisms in play that our system right now is simply accentuating that lead to an unaffordable market. What does that mean? Well, it means that we're not going to deliver affordable housing through the same approaches that we've used in the past. We need new approaches like inclusionary zoning, ensuring that every development delivers affordable housing. In America, over 500 cities have inclusionary zoning. And it's the key way that New York City, it's the key way that Chicago is, is delivering affordable housing. It's the key way Seattle is delivering affordable housing. Can, can I put this, this to Josh? This is missed in this bill. Part of the bill does provide <laughs> for allowing suites in basement apartments, uh, over garages, yes. in laneways, all of that kind of stuff. That is the kind of thing that traditionally your constituents would oppose. What's your view on it? My view is that the city of Toronto, it's not just my view, here's a fact. The city of Toronto is already acting on these things. We're already doing it. We didn't need this bill to let us know that we should. What this government has done, though, is that they actually removed this year 
all rent control on all new units being built in Ontario, meaning that there's no assurance that the vast preponderance of new rental units that are going to be built are going to be affordable to anybody. This government has, what they've done is they've put the development industry's interests before the quality of life of residents in the community, not just those who are living in the neighbourhoods. It does not address the missing middle. What it does do is just that... Just explain it, what the missing middle is. The missing middle is that we have uh, primarily single-family home neighbourhoods where there is a, a very valid argument that we should see some light intensification to accommodate more affordable housing. We also want to make sure that we have policy levers that allow for the economics of building mid-rise development along our avenues make more sense. And these are the kind of things that the City of Toronto supports and wants to move forward with. Mm -hmm. What the government has done is they've actually made it more difficult to live in either the single-family neighbourhood designated areas or the apartment neighbourhoods mm -hmm. because they're going to be less affordable. But also they took away our ability to make sure that there are parks, schools, infrastructure, recreation centres, basic components of our quality of life to be able to support those who live there today, right. but let also me, those who are moving in. Let me get Tim's view on this, because you as a former <clears throat> PC party leader, I'm interested in whether you think it's appropriate for the province to step in in the way that it has, assuming some jurisdiction over what used to be the purview of municipalities. Yeah, look, when, when municipalities break their own rules and they're standing in the way of that young millennial finding a place to call home, then I think there is a role for the province to play. What rules do they break? Well, when it came to the Young and Eglinton, uh, uh, for example, uh, development... That's because, where we are right now. And, and, and I get the game, right? Because I, I get the game. I've been in politics. I know the forces of nimbyism can very, be very strong. Councillors will react to current voters as opposed to people who want to move into the area. What rule do we break? But when you see at Young and Eglinton, where you're, the province and the city are rightly investing billions of dollars in the transportation infrastructure, mm -hmm just before municipal election to lower the amount of density that's happening in that neighborhood well, it was a terrible abrogation of good planning rules. It was all politics. The city planners are actually in favor of these developments. So does the province step in to create more affordable units for people? Absolutely, particularly when you that, put that in is, that, that kind is, of that is factually true. There's that an is... important piece that's missing here, which is that um, there's a risk, an enormous risk, to this city, to any city in this province, of just building housing and not also building the infrastructure right. that creates a livable community, which means we need schools. You can walk out this door, every development in this neighbourhood will say, by the way, there's no space left in the schools. There's no room for families in this neighbourhood. Young and Eglinton currently is building more units than the entire city of Boston. I think one of the risks here right now is that we overemphasize very, very intense, dense areas in the city, and we actually miss out on a provincial-wide scale building housing across the entire province. If we look at Oxford County as an example, Toyota would like to expand their factory, but they cannot for a very simple reason, and these are mid-level paying, job, paying jobs, anywhere between 60 and 150,000. Why? Because they cannot attract employees because employees cannot afford housing in Oxford County. So here we have Young and Eglinton with more density than the entire city of Boston and we're fixating on that even though there's no room in the local schools. You cannot put your child into swimming lessons in this neighborhood because there's so much development taking may place I, here may already. I, may, I add oh, on, may I add on to what Jen was saying because Tim, with all due respect, you said something that is just factually untrue. We are not, not only are we not breaking rules, we're also not tying the hands you're of development. You're rewriting the, Tim, your Tim, own rules Tim, before election campaign. Are you, Josh, uh, you know that, that is, that is, that is, that is, that is, that is not, on, let's, let's, Tim, let's go one at a time Tim, here, Josh, that is, that is just not true. I, I know it's, it's good, it's a good narrative for you, for, for you. you, for you, my friend, but ultimately what the city of Toronto did is spend years with consultation with the development industry, with residents, and led by our planning department, our objective independent planners, to come up with a plan that did not say no to growth. What it did was manage growth to ensure that while we grow and we recognize we're going to grow, we have room for people to be able, as Jen said, to get their kids to a recreation center, to be able to go to school. I live in Midtown Toronto, and I can tell you, at my child's school, and I mentioned this to you earlier, they had to take the sixth grade classes out of all the elementary schools, the TDSB, because they were getting overcrowded. They are struggling, and they put them into a middle school that now they're trying to figure out how to accommodate growth there. It's not about pro or anti-growth. It's about how do you do it well to support people's quality of life. You, but the Ford you, government Tim, took equal those tools away. Uh, come on. When you change the rules in the middle of the game, when before a municipal election campaign, municipal councillors start overruling recommendations by planning staff to win votes, I've got a problem with that because I've got to advocate for people who want to get into the housing what do we market overrule? and experience home ownership. Which one? 
<laughs> a whole whack of things along the Young and Eglinton, where you, you lowered the density. Now, the province has stepped in and we said, let's make this appropriate. Well, and the, with the issue with Oxford County. I think, the, I think the, uh, just to pick up on this, I think the narrative is a bit confused here because we're actually talking about one of the highest growth neighborhoods in North America, which is Young and Eglinton. The first highest is the, the downtown core. So it's not like we have a no growth scenario or a low growth scenario. I think the conversation actually needs to focus on the vast areas, both within Toronto and outside of Toronto, where there's absolutely no growth taking place and there's an opportunity to put the transit infrastructure in place, to put the schools in place to build really complete communities. Okay. Can I understand from Joe, what, if, if Toyota wants to increase the size of their facility there, and it has the potential to bring thousands more people into the area. 2,000 jobs. 2,000 jobs. Why, why are no, how come there's no home building going on there? Well, so I guess what you have to look at in Oxford County is what are the planning rules that are constraining that growth? And more importantly, what are the type of homes people are looking for to live in Oxford? So are those kind of middle class job seekers, are they going to be content moving into a six story rental apartment building? Or do they want a single family home? And guess what? Maybe you can't build them in <laughs> Oxford County anymore. You've got to build them in Waterloo Region. And suddenly now you're dealing with those economics. And so I think what's important to understand is if you look at the housing system and how it has to support the general economy, there are lots of good things that we can be doing together. But this conversation goes back to the right supply in the right place at the right time. We can't wait six years for the approval. I also want to say that, you know, we're having this conversation about growth, not paying for growth. That principle stays in place. There will be parks. There will be schools. Those things will be in place. So to take the alarmist approach that those things are on the table, that's not appropriate. It's going to happen. There's a new system coming in place here. The focus now is predictability, certainty, accountability, and transparency, things we should all agree with. The question now becomes, we have to look at these new rules and say, how do we engage in them? How do we build complete communities? It's very easy to simply point the finger and say, private development. May I, may I fact check one thing you said, though, if I may? Please. Um, are you saying that there's any assurance under Bill 108 that if a development uh, exceeds the current uh, density and height, and there's a new population moving into that building, that the local community will be able to benefit from uh, new parks, new schools, uh, new recreation centers, new infrastructure. My understanding is that it is all up in the air, and that that money that would be benefiting the local community that is you know, welcoming the growth might actually move somewhere else and not into the vicinity. I guess we're going to have to wait to see how the final rights come out to play. Exactly. But here's the reality. Here's the reality. The reality is this. No developer is going to walk into a community and not pay their fair share of growth. What has happened in the last 10 but, or but 15 years that's what is was what's happening. the number. Happening. Well, no, no. I think, but, but that's I think what that's... was happening before we had these regulations in place. I think it's really important to uh, accentuate the last point that you made, which is we don't actually know yet. There's a lot of very high level language that doesn't clearly yet articulate. And so I think we can be optimistic that there's an opportunity to ensure that mechanisms will be put in place to deal with the impacts of growth. If you go back to section 37, first of section all, section 37 of? So section 37 of the Planning Act is a section that has allowed in certain jurisdictions, for example, in Mississauga, they don't use section 37, but in certain jurisdictions of Ontario, to allow the city to capture some value that can then be used to address the impacts of adding significant amounts of density. So a local park is now going to have a lot more people using it or adding, we've added new entrances to subway stations as a result of new buildings being built. We've done that through section 37. We are expanding the path system. We've done that in the downtown core using section 37. So is that off going forward? Well, this is the problem. We don't know because it's been changed, there was this kind of strange narrative that suggested that Section 37 wasn't fair. So in some parts of the city where there wasn't <clears throat> growth, councillors, of course, did not have access to monies to be upgrading the local community. But that's for a simple reason. Section 37 was specifically designed to address impacts in neighbourhoods. Now, to pull the lens out more broadly, development charges in this city get spread across the entire city. Every time a condo gets built in downtown Toronto or Young and Eglinton, a road and a park gets, gets repaired in Scarborough. 
And that's a good thing. That's actually a way of ensuring that the infrastructure across the entire city is being maintained. And I've been in cities recently like Australia where that doesn't exist and you have a very wealthy central core to the city mm. And the suburban parks and the suburban neighborhoods are in a significant okay. so I think, state of yeah, state so I think we all agree Tim that I think we all agree the current plan is is not working. It's a failure to people who want to get into home ownership. It's a failure of people who are trying to find a rental. And what's very appealing about Bill 108, the More Homes, More Choices uh, Act, is that it helps out in Toronto. We talk a lot about Young Negleton. That's where we are in the province intervene. It helps out Oxford County. It helps out Niagara, where I'm from. The problems are that the approval process is far too slow. It is far too expensive and it is too arbitrary. And that means investment in housing is not taking place. I mean, kudos to Minister Clark. I know he's talking about this uh, on the show uh, as well. This will address those issues by speeding up development, clearing out red tape, providing more housing options across. Well, Steve, that, that's, that's just not reality. Anyone, including Tim, who would walk down most streets in downtown or midtown Toronto would never honestly say that there is no housing being built. Look at every, uh, all the condos going up. Look at all the buildings going up throughout the city. We've got more cranes in the sky than so, most any city so in North Josh America. Josh is the only guy that denies we got a housing supply crisis. How it's can you not, not say it, uh, we don't Tim, have I'm it not, I'm not. Tim, the only difference it's an between affordability your, crisis, you got it. which is it's different about, from it's, a It's about a crisis. supply of affordable housing. Bill 108 does not address our need to build affordable housing. It builds a lot of housing, luxury condos, and expensive oh, rentals. On. Okay, but again, we don't, we don't have the answer in this let, bill. Let me try this, gang. Since we are right here in Midtown Toronto, and the city did have a report come out not too long ago called the City's Midtown in Focus, which recommended new buildings around here be yes. no more than eight stories high. No, no, no. That's, actually, that's completely inaccurate. Hang on a sec. That's a completely inaccurate statement with respect to Midtown in Focus. Young and Eglinton? Baby and Eglinton? No. No, it's no. completely okay. inaccurate what you just said. In fact, it is a plan which part of part of what we did five years ago in the planning department was we shifted to a proactive approach that was about providing certainty, putting a planning framework in place so that developers would have a clear understanding of what the expectation on a specific site was for development and also the infrastructure to support it. Okay, Midtown in Focus has a variety of different built form areas that have different built form types. And in the center, it's a very dense, in fact, at Young and Eglinton, you can go as high no, as you I'm, want. Uh, and they are. So uh, that's uh, the Midtown in Focus area. Thank okay, you. but, but, okay, <laughs> I'm going by what the minister told me, which is that they have gone from eight well, stories. Well, that's terrifying if the minister told you that. Because well, it's hang, on. What, 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 hang on, maybe the minister, what did the minister say? From, from what I understand, <laughs> it was eight stories, say, for example, at Bayview and Eglinton, which is five minutes east of here. Now you can go 22 to 35 stories. You can have enhanced intensification to accommodate the added demand for this area. Uh, what I'll, do we think? Uh, so I'll give you an example. In, uh, in the Davisville Village area, which is part of Midtown in Focus, mm -hmm. buildings have already been able to go up into the 20s or some, you know, even going towards the 30s. The city is not saying no to any new, de new development in that area. What we are concerned about is that the new rules by the province allow the heights to go up in excess of 40 in an area that doesn't have sufficient infrastructure and services. And well, what the minister the city, says 35, uh, I, uh, The minister is saying a lot of things, but uh, I think that it's better to deal with absolute facts rather than the political rhetoric that we are hearing from this government to justify this bill. Um, what we're concerned about as a city is the quality of life of residents. We are not saying <clears> no to height, and we are not saying no to density, but we believe that the built form should be in context for the area. We also believe that affordable childcare services, infrastructure need to keep up with the pace of growth. And importantly, that taxpaying residents shouldn't be having to subsidize that growth. In other words, developers need to pay their fair share to support the quality so of look, this, this fiction may have worked before Bill 108, but Bill 108 does not change that. Developers will still pay for growth. Developers will still pay for childcare, for libraries, for parks. The difference, Steve, is it happens in a more predictable way. There'll be rules around it. It will go into a fund to be dispersed when communities make their planning decisions. Mm -hmm. Citizens will have a role in making up what those plans are. What it takes away is the municipal shakedown that used to exist where local councillors, and you're good at this, you're defending your citizens, I get it, would say to the developer, I'll only approve your project if you fund this pet project of mine. And then councillors would pet whip project. that across. Affordable right? child care is, yeah. is a pet project. So it should be done when there are clear School rules spaces around are a pet project the plan. Too. When the municipal councillors are sitting on slush funds to help with election campaigns, that does not help bring new housing on board. It actually slows everything okay, we get, down. we got to be careful here. Slush fund is yeah, a that, very and that, and that is, so that is so unfair. That is so unfair 
uh, to the residents of our communities, when, when you call pet projects affordable childcare, school spaces, parks, basic infra infrastructure and services. But these things well, and wait, we need Joshua, to go back and to they the planned we, waste. We know exactly where the, the money is going. But just to go back That's for a minute. Uh, four years ago, we brought in place, um, as a result of very legitimate concerns about the transparency of Section 37, we bought, brought into place a uh, report that comes out on an annual basis. We uh, put a site up on the website where you can see all the monies that are collected from a project and how they are being spent in the community. So to Josh's point, um, there is a tremendous amount of accountability that was created through that system. And the objective of doing so was to ensure that the public also could participate in a process in deciding what the priorities were in their community. So some communities decided that the priority might be the retention of a heritage building, or they might decide that the priority was improving the access to the local local subway station, or they might decide that improving the facilities at a local park and putting in place a community garden where the, par where the community could come together would be a key priority. That is very transparent, and I think the opportunity moving forward and, is but, to but ensure this that bill, the system I, but this, ironic, ironically, but this bill does this on a province-wide basis, ensures those plans will take place, citizens participating and follow every dollar from development charges across the province to the growth that's going to But start. I agree with no. Joe, like, uh, there's no assurance of that. We're still learning about the regulations. What we do know is Midtown and Focus, that was dismissed by the province, actually, as Jen said, spent years to determine what the priorities are, not politically based, not during the election, as you suggested, but ba the, like, basic infrastructure and services priorities that our planning staff would recommend based on community consultation and <clears throat> real data to support the dearth of those services. And that's how we're prioritizing the <clears throat> Section 37 in the Young and Eglinton Corridor. So this narrative around slush funds and pet projects and elections, I, I know it Empathetically, I know it meets your needs because you're selling this bill. What I'm telling you in real life, as a resident of Midtown and as a representative of Midtown, we really do need these school spaces. We really so, do need Joe, so let me, in, Joe. So let me respond from this perspective because there's a lot of political chatter around the table here. Here are the practical realities. People are coming here. That's the reality. We need the plan for this growth. That's exactly. the reality. We need all sorts of housing options, not just in Toronto, but across the board. Development needs to contribute to the growth reality. But sometimes what we attach to a growth reality isn't, when you put it to the test, a true test of it. And that's where the negotiating happens around the table. So when you speak to <clears throat> height restrictions in Section 37, there is an advantage for the city to underzone an area and welcome rezoning applications just so the local council can engage in a Section 37 negotiation. Because that's what it is. Which means what? So which, they, means they have the which means they have the opportunity to say, if you want to go from 8 to 15, <clears throat> you will need to have to contribute three, four, five million dollars for local am amenities, even though from a planning that, rationale... That's, that's not how it actually but That's actually not how, 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 yeah. how it worked. And if you, you can flip it the other way as well. The risk of taking a very complex city like the city of Toronto and putting blanket zonings in place can also mean as we see today, that you have significant underzonings. Let's talk about a very specific site, which is the one, Sam Maserati's project at uh, Young and Bloor. That is a site where, let's say that we had said, okay, well, um, the entire downtown core, we're just gonna make 60 stories. Hamilton actually did this recently, and for a variety of reasons, I think it's problematic, including some sites should probably have more density and some sites should probably, what do they want probably to do with, have, have less. What do, they, less. what do they want at Young and Bloor? Well, there's over 80, 80 uh, stories have been approved there, and what's important is that when the developer came in, our position in the planning department, so this <coughs> has nothing to do with Section 37, was this is Young and Bloor. Let's put as much density as you possibly can from a market perspective. Let that site be market-driven. Uh, and let's ensure that, as a result of that, we extract some community benefit, which we did. A new park is being built. So that makes sense. You're we okay have, with that, then? Well, that's, yes. The this You're is okay what I'm, with 80 stories at Young and Bloor? Absolutely. This okay. is what I'm saying, is that the, the risk of a blanket approach is that you also yeah. will have not enough density on some sites. It would have, we would have lost 20 stories may, worth may, of capacity may I surprise, may I surprise if we you had with just something? had a blanket zoning of, of 60. It would have been predictable, but we would have lost some opportunity. Okay. So Josh, there was, a benefit, I, 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 there was I, I, a benefit to the negotiated process that actually cuts both ways, which is good for the city, because we want to ensure that we're being nuanced and, in and, how and, we're... Okay. And Josh, yeah. and then i got to come in and, with something. And it can actually work in the best ways uh, with the development industry as well. Because 
In Young and Eglinton, we have residents who, you know, some people have suggested they're not in support of any development. We have residents associations at Young and Eglinton that have written letters in support of some of the biggest developments in the area. But they were able to do that because they also recognized that through these negotiations with the city, that there would be, whether it be, as Jen said earlier, another entrance to the subway or better public realm, genuine community benefits that contribute to leaving the place better than the developer found it. And therefore, they were reasonable and they arrived at a yes rather than a no. It actually was a win-win for everybody. It was part of the consensus building you process around new five, development. I got, got five it. minutes left and I want to make sure we touch on a couple other things. Tim, let me go to you on this first because this is a bit of an odd problem. Sure. Apparently, 58% of the GTA has de... Oh, Jennifer, is going to quibble with my numbers here. Hang on a second. 58% <laughs> of the GTA has decreased in population because some that's people right. have too much house for their needs. Did I hear you say that's right? It, well, I can speak to okay. that. Yeah, well, it okay, is right. Okay, hang on, but I haven't yep. heard Tim in a while. So the kids <laughs> have moved out, the parents are still there, and you've got, let's say, for example, two senior citizen parents living yeah. in a four-bedroom house, which may not be the most efficient use of that space. What do we do about that? Do we need to incentivize people to sell their houses or do something in order to make that space work better? My parents were in that spot, right? They had the family home and uh, the kids have moved out, the grandkids come back and visit and such. It is hard to find housing for retirees and empty nesters to move into. So the approach of Bill 108 will help create more housing choice, give them that option, be close to the grandkids and find a place that's affordable and then free up the family home. I also like the fact that this bill allows for more secondary suites. That's a source of good rental choice right across uh, our cities by way of example. And the last thing I'll say, when it comes to affordability, the province does have a great opportunity, like Mayor Bloomberg did in New York City, to use some government land, whether it be city, provincial, or federal, make a partnership with the developer for the long run, to develop housing with, with the express restriction that it be used for affordability and keep rates low. In fact, the project that uh, Google is doing in Sidewalk Labs has an enormous potential to bring in a lot of affordable housing in the city of Toronto. Okay, we're, we're not going to go there. I That's a different show altogether. <laughs> Can I get you, though, on this issue of, of how we incentivize, say, senior citizens living in four-bedroom houses to sell those, let you know, younger families move in and maybe move them into a condo or something like that? So this is a really important point. The Centre for Economic Prosperity has identified that in the GTA, there are over nine, sorry, there are over five million empty bedrooms. So we have this situation where we have encouraged a tremendous amount of staying in place. Part of the uh, land transfer tasks is part of that. It's a disincentive to people right-sizing their housing. So we're in this strange situation where we have a generation coming up that cannot access housing for their families, cannot access affordable housing. And then we have another generation that is overhoused, that has way too much housing and is, uh, quite frankly, uh, needs some kind of policy incentive in order to be uh, shifting the way they use their home, whether that means renting out a portion of their home, whether it means turning some of those homes into multi-tenanted units within an existing home, or transitioning into a home that's, that's the right mm -hmm. size. Part of the opportunity here is around missile, mi missing middle housing, what Josh mentioned earlier, is this idea of adding some gentle, gentle density in existing neighborhoods. I know when my in-laws who raised their family in Etobicoke in a beautiful suburban home, when their kids moved out and they wanted to downsize, there was nothing in the neighborhood because all of the houses were very similar. They were designed for one type of family. We know today that 28.2% <coughs> of the Canadian population lives alone. So adding, adding gentle density in existing neighbourhoods is a way of adding renters into existing neighbourhoods. It's a way of adding affordable, smaller units into existing neighbourhoods, but also providing the opportunity for residents who might not want to leave the neighbourhood that they've lived in for a very long no, time the, to okay. have a housing the, choice close I, to the, home. The, the, 30 the, seconds the, left. The issue is all these policy choices need to work in concert with each other and everything that I've seen the Ford government do thus far has actually been pulling away our ability to make things more affordable for seniors. I'll give you an example. Uh, this year, they removed all rent controls on all new rental units. In other the words, idea was to get some rental housing built. It wasn't going to get uh, built without that. But, but, That's but, not but, true but, because we're building more rental housing than we ever have. We are, we are, we are, we are, we are breaking records 
uh, certainly since the 1991 exemption uh, was, was lifted. Uh, but, but ultimately, we don't just want a supply of rental. We want affordable rental. The other thing that I would submit the government needs to look at is above the guideline rent increases and other ways that are... Uh, these rent increases, along with the lack of affordability, means that more seniors are not able to live in their communities that they've lived in perhaps for, you know, a generation. Mm -hmm. And that if impacts uh, me, isolation, okay. loneliness... I got, <clears throat> forgive me, i got to jump in because they're giving me the hook. And besides, <laughs> if we go on much longer, Jennifer will attack me for a third time. <laughs> <laughs> and we like it anyway, and we'll invite you back, of course. Josh Matlow and Tim Hudak, good of you to join us on this side of the table. Jennifer Keysmatt, Joe Vaccaro on the other side of the table. We have complete consensus on everything here tonight. Absolutely. I think. Absolutely. Go Raptors, go. Go that Raptors, my go. Sense. They went you. already. <laughs> it was great. All right. Thanks, everybody. The Agenda with Steve Bacon is brought to you by the Chartered Professional Accountants of Ontario. Helping businesses stay on the right side of change with strategic thinking, insightful decisions, and business leadership. Are you on the right side of change? Ask an Ontario CPA.